Libya, around 287 AD, at a lake in a city called Silene. There lived a poisonous, fanged water dragon. He ruled the entire countryside through fear and physical dominance. At night, he would come to the city and demand a tribute of sheep for food, and if the people came up short, he would take men instead, and exhale his poisonous breath over the town, killing scores of people and entire herds of livestock. An army of nearby men was assembled to fight and slay the dragon, but at the mere sight or sound of him, they would drop their weapons and run away as fast as they could. In an attempt to bring some order to the madness, the king of Silene ordered that the people of the town, rich and poor alike, would enter their names into a large cauldron to be selected at random as tribute to the dragon to keep his temper in check. The people were so afraid of the dragon that they willingly participated in this death lottery, and when a person was selected, the entire town worked to carry out the sentence for fear that they would lose everything to the dragon. Rich, poor, man, woman, and child alike were given to the dragon for months on end. One day, the king's daughter's name was drawn as tribute. The king was as distraught as any father would be, and as the townspeople began to gather outside, he closed his doors and pleaded with them, Please, I beg you, take all my silver, all my gold, all that I have is yours if you spare me my daughter. The townsmen rebuked him. You made this law, and we have sacrificed our own sons and daughters to keep the city safe. But now that it is your turn to sacrifice, you cower in fear and ignore our grief. Give us the princess now, or we will burn your house down with you in it, and give your daughter to the dragon afterwards. As the crowd grew angrier, the king realized he could not win. He collapsed and began to despair about never getting to see his young daughter grow up and have children of her own and live a full life. He eventually stood up and demanded that the people give him a few more days with his daughter. Reluctantly, the crowd agreed. But when the days had passed, the crowd returned and shouted at the king, You see our town is dying and the dragon is angry. Give us your daughter now. You've had your time. The king had pampered his daughter as if it was her wedding day and dressed her in the finest clothes. He gave her one last tearful embrace and kiss and then saddled her on his horse and set off to take her to the dragon himself. The king delivered the princess to the lakeside, where she had resolved to wait for the dragon, not wishing for any more suffering in the town on her account. As she waited, a strange, foreign man dressed as a knight happened by the lakeside. When he saw the young girl dressed for a wedding, sobbing by herself, he asked, "'What are you doing here by yourself?' Surprised, the princess looked up and shouted, You have to leave. Go now as quickly as you can or else you will die too. The knight moved towards the young girl and asked her calmly, Why are you here and why do you weep? My name is George. I am a knight from Cappadocia and a humble servant of God. You have nothing to fear. You can trust me. Please tell me what troubles you. The princess considered him for a moment, then told him the story of the dragon, of the town's death lottery law, and how she was delivered to the lake by her father, the king, as a way to appease the dragon and spare the town from his wrath for a while longer. After a moment, George looked at her and said calmly, Do not be afraid. In the name of the Lord, I will do what I can to help you and your people. The princess was now agitated and shouted at him once more, You don't understand. You can't beat this dragon. Entire armies have failed. Go now before he kills us both. Save yourself, I beg you. As they spoke to each other, there was a loud roar, and the dragon appeared in the distance and ran towards them with all of his speed. In a single moment, George had mounted his horse and drawn his sword. He made the sign of the cross and charged the dragon at full speed. George switched to his spear, and when the moment came, he thrust it at the dragon and hit home. The dragon writhed in pain, and as George kept it subdued, he shouted for the princess to give him her belt. She gave it to him, and he wrapped it around the dragon's mouth and neck. The dragon, injured and humiliated, was dragged alongside George and the princess back to the city. As the people saw them approaching in the distance, all they could think about was the dragon getting closer. They panicked and tried to gather their things and flee. We have given the dragon his tribute, and he is still not satisfied. Surely this must be the end, they shouted as they stumbled over one another. But as the dragon got closer, they could see George and the princess were leading it. The dragon was wounded and bound. The townspeople began to gather near the gate and followed George and the princess to the home of the king. The king saw his daughter and nearly fainted in disbelief. George stood up and shouted to the townspeople, 
My name is George. Do not doubt me. I am a servant of the one true God, of Jesus Christ, and I have defeated this beast in his name. Believe in God. Believe in our Savior. Be baptized in his name and be saved. Be baptized and we will finish off the dragon once and for all. The king wasted no time and was immediately baptized, and the crowd of townspeople followed suit. This must be the true God, and our true Savior if this man was able to wound and bind the dragon, and bring him here under his command to be slain before us, they said. At this, George raised his sword and killed the dragon by lopping off his head. George said the dragon should be scattered in the fields, so the people gathered several carts and several teams of oxen to haul the carcass away. In all, before George left town, some 15,000 people were baptized, and the king had a church made on the spot where George had slain the dragon, and in the church came forth a spring of holy water that could heal the sick. The king offered George all of his wealth and his entire kingdom for saving his daughter and saving the town, but George refused and instead told the king that he should give his excesses to the poor, and he gave the king four parting commands, build more churches, honor the priests, hear the message of the gospel, and have pity on the poor. After that, George said his farewells and departed. When George returned home from his travels around 300 AD, he found that the persecution of Christians, particularly men, was at an all-time high under the rule of Roman emperors Diocletian and Maximian. Many people were so terrified that they renounced their faith and worshipped the Roman gods. George was so upset at this that he resolved to abandon his knighthood and give all of his wealth and possessions to the poor and focus solely on being a servant of God. Now destitute, George made a point to place himself amongst the non-believers and idol worshippers. George told them that their gods were false gods, devils, and no more than statues. Who are you to claim that our gods are false, they would ask, and he would reply, I am George, a knight of Cappadocia, who has given all that I have that I may better serve the Lord. George was eventually captured and beaten nearly to death in the streets. George was taken by the pagan priesthood, branded like livestock and imprisoned. George did not waver in his faith, though. He continuously rebuked the pagan gods and claimed to feel no more suffering because the Lord was with him. The prison guards and the pagan priests began giving George poisoned wine, which miraculously had no effect. Next, they attempted to behead George using a contraption made of wheels and swords. But when they tried, the device broke and George was left unscathed. Next, they attempted to place him in a cauldron of molten lead, but when George was forced into it, it was no more than a hot bath to him. The head priest told George, Our gods have shown you patience and mercy, otherwise you would surely be dead by now. Will you not set aside your pride and worship them? George looked up at him, smiled and said, I am ready. The priest, sure about his victory over George, spread word across the town and a crowd gathered outside the temple to watch George, the former knight and steadfast Christian, make sacrifice to the Roman idols. But when George dropped to his knees, he began to pray to the Christian God and said he would destroy the pagan temple in his name. The heavens opened up and the temple was consumed by fire until all that was left with ash. Then the ground opened up and swallowed the ashes until nothing was left at all. What sort of treachery and deception is this? The priest asked George. Come with me and I will show you how I worship my God, replied George. I have seen you a fraud, George, and you will not be able to do to me what you did to my temple, said the priest. How can your gods protect you anywhere if they cannot protect themselves and their own temple, responded George. The priest turned to his wife and said, This man is blasphemous. He makes me so angry that I might die from rage. His wife responded, Have you not seen all that has happened because of this man, the virtue and righteousness of the Christians? We should not harm them. Their God will fight for them. In fact, I think I should be one of them. The priest then grabbed his wife by the hair and beat her badly. She fell to the floor and asked George, What must I do to become Christian and be accepted by your God? George answered, Do not fear, for you will be baptized by blood, and Christ is with you already. She began to pray and then died from her injuries. The next morning, the priest ordered that George be dragged through the city behind a horse before being decapitated. George prayed that this final act of faith might be used by God however he sees fit. Then George heard God answer him and tell him it would be done. George was dragged through the streets and then decapitated. Not once did he waver, and the onlookers saw this. Afterwards, when the priest and his followers left the town, 
a great fire came from heaven and burned them all to ash. George was canonized as St. George nearly 200 years later in 494 AD by Pope Galatius. By that time, the legend of St. George had grown so large that no one was really even for sure what he did do while he was alive, but they all agreed that he was a martyr. There are statues and paintings of St. George all around the Western world. St. George's cross, a simple red cross on a white background, is still widely flown in England and Italy and is the basis for many other flags in use today. His feast day is celebrated in the Catholic Church on April 23rd. St. George is one of my all-time favorite legends for all sorts of reasons. The story takes place in a transformative time period in Western history. George's main adventures are generally accepted to have happened between 287 AD and 303 AD. This was a notable period of persecution of Christians in the Roman Empire, specifically under Diocletian and in Nicomedia, the place where it is believed George was executed, along with many others. This time period in and of itself is worthy of study, we see religious and political class conflict, along with book burnings and the terrible stereotype behavior that seems to follow group tyranny throughout human history. It's not quite as simple as zealous pagans killing Christians, though. I mean, that did happen to a large degree, but you have to understand that up until this point in time, the dominant social group was the pagans, and that was starting to tilt the other way. Christians weren't just a group of people with marginal means that could be ignored anymore. They were changing the very fabrics of the Roman society. Now, if that kind of scenario doesn't ring a bell in your head somewhere. Interestingly enough, the very next emperor, taking over in about 306 AD, would be a guy we call Constantine the Great. He would order the empire-wide tolerance for Christianity through the Edict of Milan in 313, and then in 325, he would set in motion the Council of Nicaea, which would go on to produce the Nicene Creed something still said in Roman Catholic Mass, and acknowledged by most Christian denominations the world over. And, of course, those councils, full of church leaders from across the Christian world, would ultimately go on to assemble the Bible from various manuscripts and traditions. The Bible is still the most printed text in the world. Constantine would go on to make Constantinople as well, one of the great cities in history that still stands today, though we now call it Istanbul in the same modern country where George is said to have been a knight. It's also notable that the dragon portion of the legend takes place in Libya. Libya is where Hercules killed a giant, and even Herodotus wrote about monsters that lived in the wilds of Libya. Libya is sort of always on the edges of the Egyptian, Greek, and Roman influence throughout history, a faraway place that was still accessible, maybe kind of like the woods or the mountains you might go camping or looking for adventure in. I like to think of Libya as an ancient land of the quote-unquote Bigfoot stories. The thing is, though, there's a lot of stuff about George that's debatable. You can even ask if he really even existed. Was this new state religion and leadership just needing some icons to fill the void left after abandoning a host of pagan deities? Or was he just a meaningful archetype character in a story relevant to a time that spread like wildfire? After all, Horrible persecution directed at one population did happen. In this time, before the 6 o'clock news, could George have just been an allegory for all of this? Certainly by the 5th century, George was nearly a household name in the Christian world, but there is more legend than hard evidence. There are differing accounts of when George actually died and who did the killing. Some sources place it as the result of purging Christians from the Roman army, and others like the one I told above have it as the result of a more general persecution that peaked in Nicodemia. But either way, going back to that archetype theme, George's execution is just classic martyrdom. And that seems to be all that really matters. Loyalty to the bitter end, with God himself taking care of the insurmountable enemy as a sort of reward for that loyalty, whether it's the dragon or the pagans. The dragon part of this legend fits that archetype characterization in another way too. George, the noble knight who is just passing by, stops to save a damsel in distress, and ultimately a whole town from a terrifying monster. But he stays humble, and he claims victory only on behalf of God, something bigger than himself, and he demands no reward. Needless to say, George's popularity would explode as time went on, particularly in the centuries in which the Crusades were fought, which is where a lot of these legends really get embellished. 
During the First Crusade, in 1098, crusaders at the Siege of Antioch claimed St. George appeared with an army of other saints and helped to defeat the Muslims holding the city. It's really no wonder that he would go on to become a patron saint of countries like England, Bulgaria, Spain, places that have strong traditions of knighthood and claims of power through divinity that contributed to the Crusades and the general spread of Christianity over the next thousand years. But that's interesting too, because St. George exists in Muslim stories as well, and the story is almost the same, and some versions go as far as to claim he was not that far removed from people who actually knew the apostles of Jesus firsthand. He was considered a holy man who believed in God and shunned idols. Don't forget that he was from what is now modern-day Turkey, and his story took place around 300 AD, more than 200 years before Muhammad even lived and Islam came into its present form. But there's more. You can even suspect some political and identity usage of St. George in some of the Crusade-era versions of the story, such as the Golden Legend of the Saints written in the 1200s and widely copied over the next few centuries. One of the words they use when they describe the pagans in this story is Paynim. But in this time period, it really referred more specifically to Muslims. So every time that word would be read by somebody in that time period, I don't think it's that much of a stretch to think that rather than thinking about Roman pagans, they thought about Muslims. After all, they'd been at war with them for a few centuries by this point. Even though the broader, institutionalized paganism of George's day would have been Roman-themed. But whatever happened with St. George, the point is, he's an important character. An important archetype who can transcend cultural barriers, because the root of his story is really one of loyalty, courage, righteousness, and standing for something larger than himself something people universally aspire to claim as part of their identity as the good guys. And that's a segue into even more questions about St. George, particularly the George and the Dragon story. Is George and the Dragon just a kind of medieval Hollywood reboot of an older plot? If we go back to Egypt, a country that borders Libya and is even closer to Turkey, Horus is the main archetypal hero figure. And it just so happens that one famous story has him battling his evil uncle Set in the Nile. Set having taken on the form of a massive crocodile-like monster. Horus even uses a spear from horseback in this fight. You can search for this image and see for yourself how the art is almost identical to the common depictions of St. George, and the story itself not so different. Good versus monstrous evil. Next door, but no less influential, are the Greeks and their version of this story. Apollo, the loyal son of Zeus, kills a massive serpent named Python outside the city of Delphi. This pleases the residents of the city, and they quickly build a shrine to Apollo. And afterwards, Delphi would go on to be one of the most important spots in Greek mythology. Less directly, I would even consider the story of David and Goliath. David just so happens to be in the right place at the right time, the Israelite army, including King Saul, are terrified of Goliath and the Philistines. Goliath demands someone come meet him to fight, and he mocks God. The Israelites can't get over their fear of Goliath, but David is having none of it. He picks up his sling and marches out to face Goliath, knocks him down with a single strike, and then cuts off his head in front of the Israelites and the Philistines. No longer afraid, the Israelites rout the Philistines and have a renewed faith in God. I'll come back to this bit at the end. We have to consider what dragons are, too. In the Western world, they're almost exclusively evil. Norse mythology even captures this with a dragon named Nidhogg, who's always chewing at the roots of a large tree that more or less supports or represents the world. Nidhogg hopes to chew through these roots and end it all. There is more to the Norse universe for sure, but you get the idea. Dragons equal bad. You don't really even need to know a specific story to get the general idea of knights versus dragons. As an allegory for all things that are bad, dragons are perfect. Supernatural creatures that virtually no man can stand against, breathing fire or poison across civilizations at their most vulnerable moments, or chewing at the roots like Nidhogg in Norse mythology. It always takes a supreme, if not divine, act of heroism from a St. George figure to stand against them, and in that context, I think the story of St. George and the dragon makes the most sense. Archetypal good versus archetypal evil. People need heroes. We all fall short all of the time. Characters like St. George give us something to aspire to. 
and that internal belief in ourselves lets us move on to accomplish something that might seem too great for us. The dragon represents evil, and George represents good. You don't need to explain it any deeper than that for the story to inspire people to want to be like George, whether they're a soldier in a battlefield or just an average person dealing with the persecution of the day. I mentioned David and Goliath alongside Horus, Set, Apollo, and Python, or the sons of Thor and Nidhogg, because one major thing sets David and George apart from them. That's that David and George aren't gods. They're just normal people who adhere to good virtues, keep their faith in the face of monstrous evil, weather the storm, and come out ahead, ultimately inspiring more people to a cause. That's no small thing, and I think a large reason as to why they have a wider appeal and perhaps more usefulness as motivation. You don't need to wait on Superman to save the day for you. And that could be a whole nother jumping off point as to why Christianity, Judaism, and Islam have been so successful, because they are particularly empowering to individuals with no special set of physical gifts. Even if we set aside the story of St. George and the Dragon, and even if you disregard some of the miracles associated with his martyrdom, like bathing in a cauldron of molten lead, the story of his now average martyrdom would still be the story of St. George, the archetype for good, versus the dragon, the archetype for evil, in his own cultural setting of Rome at the height of a persecution for nothing more than an identity. In that sense, St. George and the dragon is perhaps an evolution of a story as old as humanity, the perpetual struggle with conscience, order, and chaos. One that can keep that fantastic sense of wonder we get from dragon stories, and at the same time not have to rely on superhuman beings like Horus and Apollo for the action, or a dense, barely readable interpretation by a PhD for the moral of the story. And that's what I think makes St. George a timeless and meaningful legend that will still be around long after we're gone. That's it for this episode of Waiting In. I hope you guys enjoyed it. See you next time. If you like lore and legends, consider supporting the show at buymeacoffee.com slash lore and legends with a one-time gift that will cost less than a cup of coffee. You can also follow on Instagram, where my handle is at loreandlegends1, and on Twitter at loreandlegends3. You can also subscribe to the Lore and Legends YouTube channel, which features video versions of all your favorite episodes. And of course, the official website, loreandlegends.net. Thanks for checking out Lauren Legends. See you next time.